all go through those moments in our lifetime that comes and goes. And if we listen to our inner voice and have the courage to follow our bliss, we experience moments that will stay with us for a lifetime. And suddenly one day I was drawn to the north. Photographer Birgitte Årstrup started her expeditions by booking a dog sled tour for nine days that turned out a little different than expected. So I arrived up north of the Arctic Circle to the most northern airport in Norway. I was picked up by this mosher and uh, drawn back to his home. And then suddenly I was told I have to be my own mosher with six dogs in front of me. That was not what I counted on. I thought I was going to sit in a sledge, just enjoying with the rain ski reindeer skin over me, but that was not the fact. So I asked the um, assistant to the mosher, can you please let me try this sledge before we go off? And he took me on a tour through the forest, and every time we had to drive around a tree, the sledge went one way and the dogs another way, and I fell off. And that happened three times. So when I came back, I said to the leader of this group, I said, I think I need to resign and go back home. So the marshal himself came up with his wolf eyes and looked straight at me and said, you deserve at least to try it. You are wanted to do this for a whole year. I will take you to the first cabin. And uh, if you cannot manage, you can go back with me. So the first cabin was a piece of cake because it was over a lake and there were no trees to turn around. So we went straight up to a cabin with the northern light glimmering above us. And I said, I can handle this. Little did I know that we had to go up over mountains, down mountains and around trees to other cabins along the road. But now I was on, I couldn't change my mind. We came in in heavy, heavy snowstorms. Sometimes you couldn't see whether it was heaven or earth you were on. You couldn't see where you were running. I could only see a red jacket far in front of me and hoping that the dogs knew where they were going. And there were times where we didn't even know if the dogs could find the way back. But we ended up coming back and I must say that was amazing. So I asked the, the guide here, what would you have done if we hadn't found our way? He said, then we have to put down the sledge and lay behind the sledge till the storm is over. That storm lasted a whole week. To go through nature like that, to go through a snowstorm, standing on dog sleds, you can't see whether you go up or you go down. You can only feel it with the sledge. Earth and heaven merge. And that nature is extremely strong. And it makes you really have to go inside yourself. Then my next draw to the north was, in a way, I've always wanted to somehow connect with the Native American people. I didn't know how. So I thought maybe if I go to Lapland and meet with the Sami people who have much in common with the Native Americans, that I would find my way. So I booked my trip to um, Kiona, with the most northern town in Sweden. And I started out with an overnight at the Ice Hotel. That is a hotel that they build every November and it run out in the river again in April. And that was an extremely fantastic experience because of the theater. They had built the global theater and where you would sit on ice bench with the northern light glimmering about you and the Sami people coming in in their colorful dresses with their drums and play Hamlet in Samish. Amazing. And to sleep in the room at the Rice Hotel was uh, the most quiet room I've ever slept in. 
So the biggest wilderness of a national park in Europe is up northern in Sweden. And that is where the reindeer herders are living. So it was their winter market. And uh, I had booked a, a bed in a yurt over on the other side of the lake from the little town. And uh, I met with those who were going to take me over there. And I sat in and I said, so how many are going to sleep here? And the man who took care of me looked upon me and said, you're the only one. Because you're two days earlier than the market is starting. I said, okay. But there was no houses, no lights, no nothing over on that side of the lake. So late afternoon, I had to go back and find where I was going to sleep. Now it's pitch dark. I only have a little flashlight to find where I was going to live. And walking over a dark, dark lake, I was thinking, what do I do if I meet a bear? But little did was I thinking that a bear hibernate and at winter time, so there was no risk for that. So then came the next thing, can I find where I'm going to sleep? And the man had put a little candlelight outside that yurt I was going to sleep in, and the stove was heating up, so it was just for me to lay down in my sleeping bag and go to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, eyes cold, eyes on the window inside, and too tired to find another firewood. I just put on a hat and socks and went back into my sleeping bag. At eight in the morning came two young guys over with coffee and reindeer meat and yolking the way that they kind of sing to the reindeers. And then they wanted to, uh, then they asked me if I wanted to go out and feed the reindeers together with them. And of course I would love to do that. That was kind of then my experience with a lot of artists and people of the Sami. And I wanted to go to something called Patjelanda. Patjelanda is the most beautiful lake up in the wilderness, up high up in Sweden. And so I called the helicopter. And the helicopter said, no, we cannot take you into Patjelanda because you're not a Sami. That was something I respected very much because instead of letting tourists run down their culture and, and their nature and everything as they do in other places, here the Sami protect their own culture. And I had then to find somebody, I met somebody with, who sold reindeer meat at the winter market. So I sent her an email and asked her if she could give me an invitation. It took me a week before she answered and then she said, you are welcome to come in and stay with us. We are in Pachelanda. Which to me was really full of luck because there are many places to go in that wilderness up high up in Sweden. And then she said, now we are leaving for Pachelanda. You cannot contact us. There's no phones, there are no roads, there are no nothing. So we just expect you to arrive on July 27. So I took the bus of the flying to Stockholm and I said, well, what if I don't find them in that wilderness? And the helicopter went down in Ayrslukta and an old Sami went off the helicopter. And I said, by the way, that is where I should get off. And the helicopter said, no, you're not a Sami. I have to fly you to Stalulukta and your people who are, you're going to live with here have to get, get you in Stalulukta. So they came to Stalulukta in a boat to pick me up. And then I stayed with them for two weeks. The Sami stories taught me a lot about life. Because man and woman overlap each other. There's nothing said you have to do or it's your turn. They automatically step in when they feel they're needed. And hunting for moose, for example, the man will go out 
a couple of weeks and they live totally alone out in nowhere in the mountains to hunt a moose. And if he comes back and he hasn't shot any, then she goes out alone in the mountain to shoot one. And so there is no really man-woman role, but they just respect each other and help each other. When you live in a wilderness like that, you are totally in the pocket of nature. So you have to help each other. But talking about the North, the Celtic wisdom calls it the challenger. The challenger because you have to face truth and you have to be aware of the consequences for your actions when you're out in the North. Otherwise, you might not survive. Meeting with the Sami people and sitting in their yurts over a cup of coffee, I asked one of the elderly, how come, in a way, that you Sami people have been traveling so much. You're sitting so far north. They have been to New Mexico. They have been to Lebanon. I mean, you name it. And she said, because we know there exists a world outside ours, and we want to know more. But we are stunned that so few people want to know about our world. So, um, I came back several times, but I want to jump in that in between I went on a Russian icebreaker to uh, close to the North Pole. And there it's, I will only say a few things because what I kind of got out of that was how small we are in nature. We have absolutely nothing to say. And the captain, the Russian captain, wouldn't know where we would be within an hour. It all depended upon the ice, where he could sail, where he could anchor, etc. So we came to an island called the Starvation Island, where a whole crew had uh, drowned back in time, an, an American crew. They never came and picked them up because the ice didn't allow it. So. Uh, Every time they come to that island, huge storms come up and the icebreaker cannot anchor. This time, it was calm. He could anchor. A, a strong voice came in the morning. I was about getting up to get ready to go on the helicopter into Starvation Island. Mm -hmm. And a strong voice came in and said, you are not going. Where they come, I don't know, but anyhow, I respected it, as I always respect voices. So I said to my roommate, I'm not going. And she said, what? You're not going? And I normally jump for everything. So she left, and I went up out of bed and said, no, of course I'm going. But the voice came back and said, no. So I didn't go. And we're standing up on the deck while they all were leaving. A storm came in so heavy that the pilot hardly could get them back on the boat. He was a Canadian pilot who had been in the Cambodia war, and he said this was the worst flight he's ever done. And I was standing on the deck, and I heard screams from the bottom of the ocean. So many explorers back in the 1900 have drowned in that strait between Greenland and Ellesmere, Canada. And they really came up talking. So uh, that was a little bit, I mean, that was, to go to Greenland and is, they say, see Greenland and you can die. You've seen the most beautiful thing you can see. It's amazing uh, nature and it's amazing wide ice sheets and the icebergs. Then I came back, as I said a couple of times, to the Sami. Then it was time for me to go on to something else. And in came, I don't know, a desire that I wanted to see the Ainu people in Hokkaido, Japan. 
Ainu people are the Aboriginal people of Japan. And I said, okay, I'm going. And I went, and I don't speak Japanese, they don't speak English, but I never like to travel with a group because it's impossible for me to take photos and to get the contact with people I need if I'm with a group. And I uh, had a fantastic tour because I was invited uh, by the elderly people by showing my Sami book. They understood who I was and, where I w and why I was there anyway, without talking. And uh, they invited me into ceremonies with, where they sang the God. No other foreigners were there. No young people were allowed either. And then they went out and celebrated the dead people. And uh, in the evening they had a dance with fire of the bear to celebrate the bear. I stood on a distance and I did like that. And the old man, the elder, did like that towards me straight down into my eyes. That gave me goosebumps. Amazing, amazing. That taught me for the first time I stand, uh, um, for the first time I started to understand the word that we are one. I've never liked that word, never understood it. That one, yes, but not same. Oneness, but not sameness. And that clarified my understanding for oneness, because here we were not speaking each the same language, and yet we understood each other. So that was my trip to Japan. Still, I was on for exploring whatever the North could show. So this time, I went to Haida Gwaii, that is the most northern island of in Canada. And I took a sailboat, 12 people, around the southern part of Haida Gwaii. There are no roads there either, and you can only get in by a boat. But there you have villages with old totem poles, still some of them standing. They say that they are one of the first to do those totem poles. So that are the old, old totem poles on the southern part of the Haida Gwaii Islands. And uh, those, each totem pole, gives the story of who is living there. Instead of a street name or street number, they have a totem pole. So I met with the chief there and the chief said to me, you missed out the evening where we were dancing, the bear dance. Then he took and showed me the lock uh, house and he performed singing the bear dance for me alone. And his name translated is the golden voice. Fantastic. So they are, have a wonderful community because they really share with each other. And yes, there is poverty, but there are great, great artists. And one of them, one of the great artists asked me if I want to go out and catch salmon with him at three in the morning. I said, I don't think that is really me. So. I came and he said, then come by at noon, then I'm back. And I said, okay. I came back at noon and then he was preparing. He had caught 17 salmon that night and he was preparing them for and to deliver them out to the whole village. That wonderful sharing of everything. I want to finish it off by uh, deciding Margaret Mead because I think she says it all. She says, human diversity is a resource, not a handicap, that all human beings have the capacity to learn from and teach each other. And that has always been my dream, to build those bridges between all those differences that we represent on planet Earth, whether it's north, south, or whatever they are from. Because that way we can support each other and we can learn a lot, 
but we have to have open minds and trying to understand each other. I thank you for listening. Birgitte Aarstrup was born in Copenhagen, Denmark, and trained by the well-known Danish photographer Jan Freddy. Her tools are purely traditional, using film, not digital, capturing moments in time, never posed, and using only the natural light. Birgitte lived in rural Sweden for many years, where she and her husband raised their three sons. In 1983, she and her family relocated to Santa Barbara, California. As a writer, Birgitte has authored and photographed Wildflowers, a book about raising children in nature, Close to the North Pole, and Eight Seasons Above the Arctic Circle, illustrating her many trips among the Sami people. And her latest book, The Indigenous Peoples of the North, where Birgitte wishes to share and preserve what is left of the culture of indigenous peoples and the beauty of untouched nature its endlessness and solitude.